Welcome back to Falcon Physician Review's online review for USMLE Step 1. This is Microbiology Module 9. We're going to be talking about the gram-negative cocci, the Moraxella, and the Neisseria species. Specifically, we'll talk about Neisseria meningitidis and Neisseria gonorrhea, and then Moraxella cateralis. Welcome to Falcon Physician Review's online review for USMLE Step 1. This is Microbiology Module Number 9, Gram-Negative Cocci about Neisseria and Moraxella species and the disease they cause. Neisseria is a gram-negative diplococci. It usually appears, it occurs in pairs of cocci. It's oxidase positive, catalase positive. You can culture it on chocolate auger, or if you want to be more selective, you'll get it on Thayer Martin medium or with heated blood. Neisseria has two clinically significant species that cause disease and they can be bad, Neisseria meningitidis and Neisseria gonorrhea. This table shows some of the important differences between the two species. I'd like to highlight that Neisseria meningitidis is one of the bacterial species that has a capsule. We also have a vaccine against it that we give to people who are at high risk for exposure to meningitis from Neisseria. The other important things uh, on this slide include uh, the port of, entry, port of entry. Neisseria meningitidis is normal flora in our oropharynx and we get it through our respiratory system whereas gonorrhea, as I think most of you know, comes from the genital exposure. Neisseria meningitidis only resides in humans, lives in our nasopharynx, causes meningitis, usually just in sporadic cases, mostly in young children, military recruits, or college freshmen. Outbreaks in adults come in crowded conditions like we talked about. This is the second most common meningitis, where pneumococcus is the most common meningitis. Neisseria meningitis is fatal if untreated, but it responds well to early penicillin therapy. The clinical findings in Neisseria meningitidis include in young children, you'll get a fever, a neck ache, you'll get Brudzinski or Koenig signs on, on examination. Like I said, this can be rapidly fatal. Meningococcemia is a, is a bad portent uh, in meningitis. You have a petechial rash throughout the body, skin and mucous membranes and conjunctiva become hemorrhagic, uh, the rash signifies early DIC, and it's a precursor to shock, which can be rapidly fatal. If you don't have complement C5 through C8, you're more likely to get Neisseria meningitidis, sepsis, and die. Common causes of meningitis are listed in this table, and again, we go by age group. With the newborns, you think about bugs that come through the vaginal system, through the normal, back, normal vaginal flora. In children, you've got pneumococcus and meningitidis. Again, pneumococcus uh, from there on out is the most common cause of meningitis. And you, it's not until you become elderly or above 60 where the gram-negative rods is more common than meningitis. So you think of the young six, to six, six months to 60 years old for Neisseria. The findings in the CSF for meningitis are different whether it's a bacterial, fungal, or viral infection. Most bacterial and fungal infections of meningitis will cause the CSF pressure, the opening pressure, to go up. If it's viral, you can usually get a normal opening pressure. The predominant cell type with bacterial meningitis is a neutrophil or a PMN, whereas in fungal, bacterial, and tuber fungal, viral, and tubercular meningitis, you're going to get more lymphocyte predominant cells. The protein goes up in all three, but less so in viral. The sugar goes down from bacterial metabolism from bacterial and fungal meningitis, but in viral they don't use as much sugar and so it's usually normal. Clinical findings of Neisseria meningitis include the Waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome, which is, rapid, which is rapidly progressive into septic shock. Usually you'll get bilateral adrenal hemorrhage and that'll knock out your catecholamines and you've got no vasopressive response. You often go into a coma and die. Again, you can get this petechial rash, uh, of, uh, which is also called meningococcemia. And you'll get these petechiae all over the place, and it's a bad precursor to disease. Pathogenesis for Neisseria meningitis includes its capsule. It's very important uh, because that helps it evade phagocytosis. The capsule is also antigenic for most species, and from that we can make a vaccine. We've got five common serogroups which are useful for serotyping, for detecting in the CSF, and for making a vaccine against four of the five most common. Also, Neisseria meningitidis has an IgA protease, which allows it to colonize and stick around in the upper respiratory tract and be our carrier. 
There's no other place where Neisseria meningitis lives, and so we have to keep it in our body. Endotoxin, because it's gram-negative, can cause fever, septic shock, just like any other gram-negative. You can also get meningococcemia, and you get overproduction in the outer membrane, which is released into the bloodstream. Meningitis has pili and other outer membrane proteins, which are important in virulence and allow it to colonize, and it has no known exotoxins. Lab diagnosis for N. meningitis includes catalase positive, oxidase positive, and you can get a rapid latex agglutination test in the CSF to detect capsular antigens. Usually, when you've got a case of suspected meningitis, you don't wait around for the culture. You get PCR or the latex particle agglutination. You can get a gram stand of CSF, and that'll help you, and then you grow it on chocolate auger or Thayer Martin. The DFA, or direct fluorescein antibody test, is also very helpful. Treatment for meningitis includes ceftriaxone and penicillin. When you have contacts of people with Neisseria meningitis, you want to treat them prophylactically and also carriers. Give them Cipro or Rifampin. It highly concentrates in the saliva, which will get in your nasopharynx and, and kill the bug. You want to give a capsular vaccine to people who are at high risk. It gets these four strains, which I don't know that it's important you know the specific strains. Type B causes half the diseases of Neisseria meningitis, and we don't have a vaccine against it because the, the, polysaccharide, the polysaccharide capsule is not immunogenic. Neisseria gonorrhea is only found in the human genital tract, and it's the second most, cause, most common cause of venereal disease, second to chlamydia. Uh, it's transmitted by a sexual contact or through the birth canal. You can get disseminated infections, which give you arthritis, or a rash with signs and symptoms that can wax and wane. Neisseria gonorrhea has certain pathogenic features, uh, which allow it to adhere to the genital epithelium and make antigenicity. The pili help it to adhere to the mucosal. They'll give it antigenicity, they give it phase variation because it'll change its pili all the time, and it's antiphagocytic. You have OPA proteins in the outer membrane that have the same features of pili, and they're involved in firm attachment. Neisseria gonorrhea makes an IgA protease, which also aids in colonization. Pathogenesis continued for Neisseria gonorrhea includes the endotoxin. Just like other gram-negative bacteria, it has LPS, which it sheds into the bloodstream and into the urogenital tract, which causes upregulation of TNF and IL-1. You have penicillin resistance due to a beta-lactamase in some, and you have altered penicillin binding proteins. You also have iron binding protein, and in, in patients who have a C5 through, through C8 deficiency in their complement system, which forms a membrane attack complex, these people are predisposed to get bacteremia and get bad disease. Clinical findings for gonorrhea include a urethritis, which is a purulent discharge. Uh, you get dysuria or painful urination, and you get redness, swelling, and pain. In females, you can also get higher up reproductive system, system disorders like endocervicitis and pelvic inflammatory disease. If you have pelvic inflammatory disease that gives you a perihepatitis, that's also known as the Fitz-Hugh-Curtis syndrome. You can get direct extension from an inflamed reproductive system where the bugs ex ex extrude through there into the liver capsule and cause a perihepatitis. The two most common organisms to cause uh, pelvic inflammatory disease are Neisseria gonorrhea and chlamydia. Clinical findings include a migratory monoarticular arthritis, disseminated infections. You can get ocular infections, especially in the ne newborn. You can get ophthalmia neonatorum and conjunctivitis in adults. The lab diagnosis is based on gram stain and smear, where you have number, uh, numerous amounts of polymorpho polymorphonuclear cells, which give you the pus and dysuria, and lots of gram-negative diplococci. Many of them are intracellular, but you don't get intracellular growth. Lab diagnosis for the purists, it's catalase positive and oxidase positive. Most people use PCR or DFA in order to get the diagnosis a little bit more quickly. Treatment for Neisseria gonorrhea is different than meningitis. Because it has the penicillinase resistance, you want to give it ceftriaxone. You can also give ceftriaxone and doxy, which will also treat concurrent chlamydial infections. And this is an empiric outpatient treatment. You have somebody come in, they have cervicitis, they have uh, urethritis. You want to hit both of them because they travel together so frequently, so you want to give them cefoxetin and doxycycline. Moraxella is our third gram-negative cocci. It's a common cause of otitis media, especially in children. It causes other upper respiratory tract infections such as sinusitis, laryngitis, tracheitis. 
Carriers will often have M. cataralis in their oropharynx, and sometimes they'll find it in the vagina. It's more common to attack children, the COPD patient, and the immunose compromised. Lab diagnosis is catalase positive, oxidase positive, uh, sucrose is utilized. You treat M. cataralis with amoxicillin. If you're allergic to penicillins, you can use trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. Let's do some questions. You're working in the pediatric ER when a father brings in his one-year-old daughter. He states she's had a fever for two days and she's been irritable. She started vomiting and now she's lethargic. You examine her and note that her anterior fontanelle is bulging. You immediately perform lumbar puncture and start her on IV antibiotics. The gram stain reveals gram-negative diplococci. The headmistress at her preschool calls you and wants to know what should be done for the child's classmates. All right, so we, they give us the diagnosis in the question stem. We know we have Neisseria meningitis meningitis, and we worry about carriers and contacts. We want to know what we should do for them. So should we A, reassure that they're not contagious and the other children can be safely monitored? No, this can be rapidly spread and can be fatal, and it's a bad thing, and you don't want these other innocent children to get sick. Do you immunize the other children? Do you give them an immunization? Or do you treat the children with prophylactically with rifampin? You treat the contacts. You immunize people who are at high risk with the vaccine, but people who are exposed to people with the meningitis uh, disease need to be treated prophylactically. I don't think you have to perform lumbar punctures on all the kids and treat those with positive gram stains. Next question. A 25-year-old male presents with dysuria and a purulent discharge from his urethra. Microscopic examination gives you gram-negative diplococci. Which of the following is the most common extragenital location for disseminated infection with this organism? So we knew that Neisseria gonorrhea could cause disseminated infections. Uh, we didn't really talk about it involving the heart. We did talk about liver with a perihepatitis of the PID, but it's not going to be common in a male. We, talk, we didn't really talk about skin. You can get meningococcemia, but not really a petechial rash from gonococcus. You can get it in the eyes. We talked about neonatal ophthalmia. We also talked about conjunctivitis in adults. More commonly, however, is this mono monoarthritis. The most common extragenital manifestation of gonococcus is in the joints. It's a monoarticular disease. Next question. A pregnant woman at 37 weeks gestation is found to have gonorrhea. All of the following are appropriate to prevent ophthalmia neonatorum except. So you've got a, a birth canal which is popping with gonorrhea. And you don't want the baby to, to get the infection in the eyes. So you can deliver by cesarean. I don't know that most people, I don't know that you would just to keep them from getting ophthalmia neonatorum, but you could. You could give silver nitrate or erythromycin eye drops to the newborn at the delivery. Uh, you could treat the mother with ceftriaxone prior to delivery, um, but most people would frown upon treating with chloramphenicol. Mostly you worry about gray baby syndrome and aplastic anemia with chloramphenicol. And also it's not one of the most effective medicines against gonorrhea. So the best answer for this, uh, for the except, is E. You don't want to give chloramphenicol to the baby. Do a cesarean, give them eye drops if you need to, or treat the mom prior to delivery. Next question. Infection with Moraxella cataralis can cause all of the following infections except. So this is a you have to know cold answer that Moraxella cataralis causes upper respiratory tract infections, which is otitis, sinusitis, bronchitis, or pneumonia, or even a tracheitis, but it is uncommon to cause endocarditis. I'm sure you could find a case report someplace, but it's, you're not going to find uh, many episodes of it. Let's wrap up Module 9 for Microbiology. We talked about Neisseria gonorrhea, which is a common cause of urethritis, frequently found with chlamydia. Also, we talked about Neisseria meningitidis, a frequent cause of meningitis, not in the neonatal period so much, but at the teenage and young adult age. Finally, we talked about Moraxella cataralis. You should be familiar with the, cat, with the pathogenic features of each of these bugs, what we use to treat them, how we test for them, and their morphologic reactions. Next up, we're going to go to Module 10, talk about the spore-forming and non-spore-forming gram-positive rods.